Baptist here this morning. We're glad that you're here. It's good to see all of your faces. Hopefully everybody had a great Thanksgiving. Uh, we know that we have so much to be thankful for this year, for, for all of you, for this church, for all God has given us. And we're also thankful for all of those that have given to the teen gift card outreach this year. We've almost reached our goal. We're about almost to 23 gift cards, so that is incredible. Thank you so much for your giving to that. If you do want to still give, today would be the final day, so make sure you get that in if that's something you're still wanting to do. But as we pivot away from Thanksgiving, we're headed towards Christmas, and that leads us to this morning and our Christmas kickoff this morning. And we titled the Christmas series this year, Prepare Him Room, and it's going to be for the next four weeks. Right, and we want to begin uh, where it all begins, but we have to address the fact that there seems to be some differing of opinions as far as how, where, and when we can begin celebrating Christmas. People got angry this year about people celebrating early. So, like, I guess the general consensus is that if you're normal, I guess is what I hear, I'm not in this category. If you're normal, apparently you begin to prepare and celebrate for Christmas, like, either, like, right before Thanksgiving or typically, like, the day after Thanksgiving. Um, if you are me, something starts to pitter-patter in your heart at the end of October, and November 1, it's like Christmas, full full-blown, the songs, the decorations, all of that. And if you are like Hobby Lobby, apparently Christmas begins in June because they have like six aisles. My kids and I will go in there and I'm like, we're not going over there because I'm not ready for that yet. But I think we can all agree that no matter when or how we begin to celebrate Christmas, eventually we start celebrating Christmas. Eventually it starts, we see our first Christmas decoration, hear our first Christmas song, someone starts it for us. Um, but we begin to prepare. We prepare our budgets, we prepare our minds and our gift lists and our home. We even rearrange, at least in my house, I'm a visual decorator. So we rearrange furniture and we put the whole tree up and all of its ornaments. And then I say, I don't really like it there. And we move it all the way across with ornaments and all falling all off. But eventually it starts. And so that is point number one this morning. It starts and we want to start where it all starts. But just as there are difference of opinions of where and how Christmas should be begin, there's also different ways that we could start the Christmas story. We could start it with Mary, and when the angel came to her and she conceived, we could start it with Joseph and the angel. We could say the Christmas story starts all the way back at creation when um, God came and sin entered in the world and he began his amazing plan of redemption. We could say it was when the Old Testament prophets foretold the Messiah. There's so many different places we could start the Christmas story. But we are going to begin today with John the Baptist because we're going to be looking at the book of Luke. And John the Baptist is in the first chapter of Luke. He begins the Christmas story in, in Luke. And another reason is because we're not just preparing room at Christmas time. Christmas time is a great time to prepare room to celebrate Jesus. But we sing, I will make room all year round. And that's our job all year round is to prepare room in our hearts and our lives and our schedules for Jesus. And so John the Baptist is a great picture. His job in scripture was to prepare the way for Jesus, to prepare an opportunity for people to hear about the Messiah. And so we think what a better way for us to look at preparing the, the way for Jesus this Christmas season than the one who prepared the way for him in scripture. So we're going to be looking at the book of Luke. And if you have your Bible with you, feel free to turn there and follow along with us this morning. And we're going to pick up, not with John the Baptist, but actually with his parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth. So there it is. It's, it's, it's even controversial within the scripture that we're using. Here. Did it start with John or did it start with John's parents? Well, for, for today, we're going to start with John's parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth. And just like all of us, John had an origin story. And his story started with his parents. And they were well along in years. They had grown old. And in God's eyes, that they, they were seen as upright in his sight. They would had always obeyed the commandments, and they were blameless following the regulations that God had set forth. But they didn't have kids. That's something that they had wanted, but they never had them. They'd been praying for them, but they never had them. Elizabeth was barren, so she couldn't have kids. But nevertheless, they were faithful, and Zechariah was faithfully serving as a priest in the temple. And this is where the story picks up. Zechariah is burning incense in the temple, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, an angel shows up, the angel Gabriel. And it says that he was, he was startled, he was alarmed, he was afraid. 
And I think I would be too. I don't know about you if I'm burning incense alone in the temple and all of a sudden I turn and see an angel. I, I might be a little bit startled as well. But the angel said, hey, don't be afraid. God has heard your prayers. And he began to explain that his wife would conceive a son. And so I just want to stop right there just for a second and, and think about the origin story for John. It started with his parents. The angel said that John would be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. So that was really the beginning of his story. And I want you to think for a second, the beginning of your story. Not, not with your parents, uh, ew, not, not that part of the story, but the part of the story where you started to enter into a relationship with Jesus. John the Baptist, he was filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. But what about you? Where was it in your life, where were you in, in your journey that you could point to and say, you know, it was at this point, it was at this time when things started to become real to me. I started to grab on to that, and, and I actually believed in Jesus. I, I entered into a relationship with him. Where were you at? And maybe you're sitting here today, and you're thinking, well, I actually haven't even started that yet. My origin story is still playing out. That's okay. Think about that too. Maybe you can point to a specific person or place. Maybe you can't, but maybe you need to think about, should I begin that story today? Yeah, because it starts for all of us, just like Christmas. Um, it starts around us, but it doesn't necessarily have to start in our home uh, until we begin to decorate. So it, eventually it starts for you, um, your walk with Christ. So someone either prepared the way for you to hear about Christ, or maybe you started the journey by entering a church, or maybe a pastor was just willing to share the, the right word at the right time. So eventually it starts for you, but how many know no one's going to come into your house and decorate your tree for you? right? So it starts for you, but it also has to start with you. So someone can prepare the way for you, but it has, to, something has to start with you, which is point number two. It starts with you. Someone prepared the way, but you had to choose it. So John the Baptist, the same was true with him. He had the job to prepare the way for the Messiah. His job was not to make sure he prepared the way and everyone received. It wasn't, John, we're going to make sure that every single person you talk to makes sure that they know and understand Jesus. And that the same is true with us. The job is prepare the way. And it starts with you. But he had to believe that calling. So, like he said, it started when he was born. So someone could say to him, hey, John, you know, this is what you're going to do. And he could do that job. But do you think he would have prepared the way to the Messiah well if he didn't believe it within him? We can do something, but we, we do it a whole lot better when we believe in what we're doing rather than it just being something that we do. And so at some point in John's journey, when he was born all the way to when he actually started, so Jesus started his ministry at 30, so John had to wait quite some time until he actually started to prepare the way for Jesus. At some point in those years, he had to make a decision. My job is to prepare the way for the Messiah, and I also believe in what I'm going to say. I also believe that it's worth it. I also believe that it's true. I also believe that it matters because people can prepare the way for us, but we have to believe it within us. We have to begin to allow God to do stuff in us. And some of us have, but this Christmas season is a beautiful opportunity for God to do something new in us. Every, every day is a beautiful opportunity, but every Christmas is a unique opportunity for us to remember what we're preparing room for and why and how he can continue to do something within us. So we pick back up on the story. The angel continues to speak to Zechariah, and he's letting him know some of the characteristics that will describe John. And Luke chapter 1, verse 14 is on the screen. This is what he says. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. And that phrase, many will rejoice, kind of stuck out to me. I've, I've read it before, but it stood out to me this time because the thought came to me, who are the many that will rejoice? Now, certainly there were those that would rejoice while John was alive, but the thought came that actually you and me, we could actually be included in the many who will rejoice. I've never actually rejoiced in John the Baptist's birth, but when I think about what John did, he prepared the way for the Lord, I can step back and say, you know what? I can rejoice in that. I can be grateful for that. I'm glad that he lived because of what he did. He prepared the way for the Lord. And I want to think about that in the context of your own story, your own life. Who can you point to? Who can you rejoice in and say, you know what, I'm thankful for them. I'm thankful maybe I didn't even know them, but they prepared the way for the Lord. I can rejoice in that. 
And here we are, you know, generations and generations, really thousands and thousands of years past when John lived. And we can look back and say, you know, I, I could rejoice in him. My hope is, and maybe your hope would be also that years from now, generations from now ahead of us could look back at us, look back at me and say, you know what? I never really knew him, but I'm grateful for him because he prepared the way for the Lord. Maybe it's me as a pastor. Maybe it's Joe as a friend. Maybe it's as a dad. Maybe it's as a coworker. There could be so many different positions and we all have different hats that we wear, different roles that we play, but somebody, maybe even generations and generations, you know, I never knew great grandpa, but I know that he prepared the way for us to receive the Lord. And, and that's really what we want to do. We want to help other people do that. I think about my own life, right, as a young kid, maybe five years old, you know, over 30, over 30 years ago, Christmas morning, coming downstairs, so over excited. Over 35 years ago, I just want to make that correction. <laughs> Long time ago. Uh, maybe 38, I don't, I don't know. Whatever it was. Anyway, I'm a little kid, right, excited for Christmas morning. My little brother's there, my sister's there. We're ready to tear into the presents. And, of course, my dad would say, hold on, not yet. We're not going to open anything yet. And some of you know what's next. He said, we got to read from the Bible. And he would take out the family Bible, open it to, to Luke, and begin to read the Christmas story. And I can remember just that feeling of a little kid, oh, come on, hurry up. This is taking forever. Now, thankfully, he didn't read the genealogy part, you know, that at least we skipped that part. So it came to that moment. I remember that feeling. But you know what I don't remember? I don't remember what I got for Christmas that year. I don't really remember a lot of the toys and the trinkets and the, all that stuff. That's all long gone. But what I remember is the principle of what my dad was doing. He was preparing room for his family. He was making Jesus a priority. He was setting a standard. And, and you know what? Today I've carried that forward. It's something that we're doing in our own family. And I'm so thankful I can point to my own parents and say, I'm grateful that they prepared room and made the path straight for us as kids. Yeah, and this isn't just about kids, and it's not even just about young kids, because some of you have grown kids, and you think, did I miss the mark? No, you didn't. There's always an opportunity for you to prepare the way for Jesus in how you show your joy and peace, in how you show and share your kindness of words, in how you forgive, and how you open your heart and your life to opportunities for people to come to know Jesus. So this isn't just about preparing room on Christmas morning. This is about year round. And I have, um, I have a couple of friends in here, so they might laugh when I say this, but I, I kind of always say that I'm like a really horrible friend. Like I'm, the, I'm a great friend, but I'm a horrible friend because I wish I was the kind of friend that was like, hey, want to go to coffee? Or like, hey, let's go shopping. But I'm the kind of friend that's like, nice to meet you. I love you so much. Let's, let's talk about Jesus. Because truth be told... There's something within me that I want to give the people that I meet the best gift that I've ever received. And I truly mean it and I truly believe it. And so I want to prepare the way for every single person I encounter. And so with my friends, I love them so much that the best gift that I can think to give them is Jesus. And so that's, I just make a beeline right for it. Maybe I should start with the coffee sometimes. But the, but this, the same is true for you. We should love these people just like we do at Christmas time. We get these gifts because we love them. We think about them. We want, that, we want to make them happy at Christmas. The same is true. We have a gift within us that we should look at the people that we love and know and interact with. Well, even the ones that we don't love. <laughs> and interact with and say, I have a gift within me. And I so desperately want you to receive that gift. I so desperately want you to understand that it could just start, and you could just hear me talk about Jesus, but I want it to start something within you. Because it does start, and it does start, start something with us. But also, when it starts with us, when we begin to really bubble over, it will start something in other people. And that's point number three this morning. And there's really something unique about Christmas, right? Think about Christmas. Out of every day of the year, or every season of the year, there's nothing like Christmas that brings people together. And we want to pick back up in verse 16 in chapter 1, and Zechariah continues to hear from the angel about John. And th this is what the angel says. He said, he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And then skip ahead. He said, he will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So John 
his whole job was to prepare people for the Lord. And that's really what we're doing in this Christmas season. We're preparing people, space, to come together. We're bringing people together to celebrate Jesus. That's really what we're doing. And, and that's exactly what John did. He brought people back. Some people had strayed, and he brought them back to the Lord their God. And others, parents, their hearts were apparently away from their kids. Something was going on in the nation of Israel at that point where some of the parents' hearts had turned from their kids. We can see that even today in our society. It's a strange thought to think, like, how can a parent's heart have turned from their kid? But when we really think about it, sometimes we just get so caught up in our own situation and our own lives, and sometimes we're frustrated with our kids. Well, I've tried before. I've presented Jesus before, and you know what? I'm just going hands off. I've, I'm done with that. They, they, they'll figure it out. They'll figure it out somehow on their own, or maybe Jesus is just for me. Maybe it's not for them, but that's not the case. That's not the situation. As parents, we've been given the opportunity to shape the atmosphere. We've been given the responsibility to influence our kids, and so at any other time of the year, could there be a better time than now for the hearts of parents to be turned back to kids? Think about that at Christmas time. At Christmas, more than any other time, people are ready and willing to hear about Jesus. Even people who are far off, far away from God, at Christmas time, they may not even believe in Jesus, but at Christmas, they know there's something unique, there's something special about Christmas. It's even in the name, right? Christ is in the name Christmas. That's what it is. And they can recognize that. And there's a level of curiosity. And so families, whether they're strong and godly families, whether they're crazy broken families, with all kinds of families, everywhere in between, blended families, this family, that family, guess what? At Christmas, if there's ever going to be a time where they come together, it's Christmas. And that creates an opportunity. There's a curiosity about Jesus at Christmas. But it's not just for our homes. It's for church, too. At Christmas, the research has been done by Lifeway Research, and what they found is that around Christmas time, six out of ten Americans will come to church, typically. Now, that leaves 40% that don't go. But out of that 40%, 57% say that they would go if someone that they knew invited them. Think about that. Over half the people that don't go to church say, hey, I would go if someone I knew invited me. And that takes us back to, to those invites on your chair. You know, those are there for a reason. That's not for you. Hopefully, you already know to come to church. That's for you to hand to someone that you know. And you don't have to use the paper. It's just a convenient, easy way for you to do it. You can text, you can call, you can invite in person, you can do it a hundred different ways, but that's an intentional thing for you to put in your hand and to put in the hand of someone that you know that's not already plugged into a church that needs to know Jesus this Christmas. Out of any time of the year, we've got Christmas, we've got Easter, and the research shows that the odds are in your favor at Christmas to reach somebody for, for God, and that's what it's all about. And it's not just about them coming to church. It's about preparing the way. Because we know that sometimes coming to church can be a beautiful first step. But I already talked to you about how it is about relationship. I joke that I say I, I don't go to coffee with my friends. I do. But it, it is about relationship. It is about time. It is about getting to know them and getting to know and understand where they are. And sometimes when we get in that process of preparing the way, maybe we think about someone that we're like, okay, I want to prepare the way. I, I want them to know Jesus. I want them to know the, Jesus the, the way that I do. Um, we get caught in that process because we get to know almost a little bit too much about them, and we think they might not be ready. They might not be willing to change. They might not be willing to receive or walk the other way. And we put this lull or this pause in between getting to know them and actually offering them the gift, the best gift that we have inside of us because we're worried about how they may, might receive it. And I want to remind you that our job is not to convince them to believe in Jesus Christ. That's his job. Jesus can do the heavy lifting. The Holy Spirit can speak to people's heart and let them know that, that there's more for them, that he created them and there's more. Our job is just to prepare the way. But we create this space, and John the Baptist also had that space. We told you. He was born. He had the calling. He had to wait. Can you imagine having a calling, knowing that you're going to prepare the way for the Messiah? You had to know something was different, and waiting 30 years. Can you imagine sitting on what you believe that gift is? And sometimes we don't have to sit on, we don't have to sit on the gift ever, but sometimes we choose to. 
We choose to put that waiting period in, and all we're doing is we're keeping other people from hearing and having the opportunity to encounter Jesus. Um, there was an accident this weekend, and uh, this week, and we wanted to address it, and we thought this was a good spot for it. But there was a tragedy in Marion this week. A mother and four kids had an accident, and two of the kids passed away. Many of you know about it. Um, so first of all, can we just as a community and as a body of Christ be in prayer for that mom and those kids this holiday season? Um, be in prayer for the first responders that inevitably are going to be thinking about that and having a hard time with that. And for just the community, the kids in the classroom and all of that. Um, but anytime something like this happens, I don't know about you, but it causes me to think. It causes me to remember that we don't know what tomorrow holds. And sometimes that's a scary feeling. Both of my kids faced that this week. They had to enc encounter what was going on. And they faced that, that fear and that thought of, we don't know what tomorrow holds. And we certainly don't use things like this as a scare tactic. Oh, you better come to Jesus because you don't know what tomorrow holds. That's not what we do. But it is a reminder of the space that maybe we've put in some of our relationships, of the space of maybe conversations that we should have had to prepare the way to say, why are we waiting? There's an urgency, that there's an opportunity. Jesus is coming. So Advent, and we're not doing a traditional Advent series, but Advent for Christmas is not just about preparing room in our hearts for Jesus and for him coming and celebrating his birth. It's about acknowledging that there's more to this life and that he will come again. And really, that's what, why we're here, right? We invite Jesus into our hearts because it's, it's about more than just here and now. It's about the future. And so if we can remind ourselves in our relationships, in our conversations this Christmas season, when the odds are in our favor, to say, I have a gift. I want to share it. God has done something in me. And I want him to do something in you. I want to start something in you because I love you, because I care, because I don't know what tomorrow holds, because why wait when I have a gift to give you? I think there's sometimes that we just, we wait, and I don't, I don't know why, but um, there are actually some real reasons we wait that we do know about, so we'll talk about yeah, so sometimes we just don't know what to say or how to say it. And I think the story of John actually can help us a little bit, give us a little bit of an example of what maybe we could do. And so we skip ahead 30 years in John's life, but it's only two chapters in the book of Luke. We go to Luke chapter 3, and we see that John is now doing what he was called to do. He's preparing the way for the Lord, and he's, he's proclaiming the news about the Messiah, and he's telling people to be baptized and to repent from their sin, to turn away from their sin. And crowds had gathered. People were interested in hearing what was going on. And so there was a crowd there. And someone in the crowd, the crowd asks, what should we do then? And so he addresses the crowd. And sometimes that's exactly what we do. And that's okay. That's sometimes what we should do. We should address the crowd. We should make general blanket statements about Jesus and about the reason for the season, about why we hold him near to us and who he is to us. But, not, but he didn't just stop there because other people in the crowd or groups of people in the crowd also asked questions. That There were some tax collectors there. They asked questions. And there were some soldiers there. They asked questions. And he took the time to address each specific question. He saw different backgrounds. He saw different walks of life. He saw different worldviews. And he was willing to listen to what they had to say. He was willing to hear their concern and address their situation specifically. And so I think that that is a really good example of something that we can take. Sometimes we just want to say a blanket thing to the crowd and move on. But sometimes we got to stop. We've got to take the time to get to know someone, to get to know their background, to get to know their story, and to be able to address them specifically and individually. The other thing I like about this verse, um, depending on your translation, the beginning of verse 12, Luke says, even tax collectors came to be baptized. And that would not ordinarily have stood out to me, that phrase, even tax collectors. But we've been watching the series, The Chosen. Has anybody watched that? Chosen, it's, it's an incredible, it's really well done. It really helps the scriptures come to life. If you've not seen that, I'd encourage you. You can watch it for free. You can stream it online for free. Take some time and do that. It will really help you connect with scripture. But in that, there's the portrayal of the disciples and Jesus calling them and the ministry of Jesus. But, of course, Matthew was called 
and Matthew was a tax collector. And we can start to see why it was that the Jewish people disliked the tax collectors so much. They were considered the worst of the worst. Nobody liked them. They would always pick on Matthew, throw stuff at him, spit him. They did not like him. They thought he was way out there. And so that is why I thought that the even tax collectors phrase that Luke put in there was significant. Even those guys, even the guys that everybody thinks they're way too out there, there's no way that they could come, but they came. And so some of us know those people in our lives and we think, oh, there's no way that they would believe. There's no way that God could still move in their life. There's no way. But even tax collectors came in. And that's true for us. We can't give up on anyone. Not anyone is outside of God's reach. So in closing, we've talked about, Leah, if you'll come, we've talked about a lot of things this morning, and we want to ask these questions. We're going to give you some time to think and to allow God to speak, and we would love for you to answer these questions in your heart and mind. Sometimes it's easier to read them and maybe not actually create an answer for yourself, um, but to be real with yourself. Uh, first is, how did it start? And I would add to that, has it started? So did someone prepare the way for you? Who prepared the way for you to receive Jesus? Thank God for that moment. And think about that moment, how it changed your life. How did it start? And how does it start with you? So that's multifold. <laughs> the first part is, how can you prepare room in your schedule, heart, and life for God to work in you this season? So how did it start with you? At what point did you or are you willing or are you going to say, okay, God, I know it started around me, but I'm going to take a minute and let something happen in me or something's already happening in me. I've known you for a long time, but Lord, this Christmas season, I'm asking you to do something new. I'm asking you to remind me of the goodness of what we're celebrating, which is Jesus, who is worthy, who we adore, who is exalted, who is more than enough who his way is better, who knows you intricately. How does it start with you inside? But how does it start with you for others? Because how can you prepare room to start something in others? Is it your time? Is it the words that you speak? Is it inviting them on the 23rd for the candlelight service? What is it? It could be something simple. It could be something difficult, like preparing our homes for us, it's messy. We move all the furniture, we clean everything. It takes a little bit of work. You end up having glitter all over the things. It's expensive. Christmas is expensive. I don't know if you know that, but it is. <laughs> Gifts and food and all the things. Preparing for Jesus. We could do all of it this Christmas season. We could do every ounce of Christmas things this season and forget to prepare room in our hearts and in our minds for what it really matters. And these moments affect how we, how the rest of us perceive, Je how the rest of people around us perceive Jesus in us. How we make room for him. They see that. They see how you live your life. They see how we invite. And it's, a, it, it's an extension where Jesus is hands and feet. So we want you to take a few minutes. Um, we are going to be down front. If you have someone in your life, a family or friend that you're in relationship with, and you want to see them meet Jesus. You want to prepare the way for Jesus for them this Christmas season. We're going to be down here. We want to pray specifically for them. Don't worry. We're not going to have you down here for 20 minutes. We just want to agree with you that this season, they'll meet Jesus in a new way. If you have a need this morning, we will also be here. But we'll close in a minute. Um, but if you'll just take this minute. She's going to sing. If you'll just answer these questions and reflect.
Shake up the ground of all my tradition Break down the walls of all my religion Your way is better Your way is better Shake up the ground of all my tradition Break down the walls of all my religion Your way is better Your way is better Here is where This is my surrender, this is my surrender, here is where I lay it down, you are all I'm chasing now, this is my surrender. Shake up the ground of all my tradition Break down the walls of all my religion Your way is better Your way is better Shake up the ground of all my tradition Break down the walls of all my religion Your way is better Your way is better Here is where Every bird and every crow. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. So we want to just take a second this morning and just make a little bit of room for this moment. And if you would, if with your eyes closed and your head bowed, you know, if there was someone in this room this morning, we want to make sure that we're making room for people to to start that origin story, for the, to, to just take that step of faith. And if you're here this morning and you're saying, you know, I've never entered into a relationship with Jesus and you want to, would you just slip your, head, your hand in, into the air so that we can pray with you? If that's you and you're just saying, you know what? I know that this is real and I know that this is for me and I want this for my life. Would you raise your hand this morning? God, we thank you for the opportunity to come into your house and to give you praise. God, we thank you for the ability and, God, the opportunity to make room today for you and each day for you. God, we ask that this Christmas season that we wouldn't just get caught up in the hustle and the bustle of the, of the parties and the gift giving and all the things, but God, that we would truly make room for you. God, it has to start with us. Would you help it to start in each of our hearts and each of our minds this morning, God, that we would catalyst forward from today, walking out exactly what you put into us, God. 
Help us to help other people and help us to prepare the way for others, God. Give us a supernatural courage and boldness. Help us to be in tune with you, Holy Spirit, that you would be the one that would give us the words to speak, that you would show us the right person in the right time in the right place to invite and to start a relationship with and to start a conversation with God. We believe that you're going to do amazing things this Christmas season. And we give you glory right now for all of them. Bless your people this week. Go with them and go before them. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, everyone.